Allora, buongiorno a tutti e grazie della, della presenza nonostante lo sciopero eh, di stamane. E, mh, diamo il via alla, alla mattinata di lavoro eh, il cui titolo è e il tema è legato ai disturbi di personalità verso il DSM V. Eh, abbiamo pensato di fare questo incontro eh, perché di solito le edizioni del DSM sono eh, una buona occasione storicamente per eh, cercare di fare il punto della situazione, condividendo o meno le prospettive che mano a mano eh, si eh, dipanano dalle discussioni attorno alle eh, possibili rivisitazioni. Eh, in questo caso in maniera particolare la discussione è stata molto complessa, molto articolata e eh, potrebbe o dovrebbe portare a una rivisitazione eh, estremamente radicale di alcuni nostri modi di concettualizzare la personalità, per cui ci è sembrato come gruppo eh, della Bicocca e eh, insieme ai colleghi del PD Lab che potesse essere un'occasione quella di eh, un corso d'opera, visto che siamo in attesa per l'anno prossimo della pubblicazione dei nuovi, dei nuovi criteri, del nuovo inquadramento, di eh, discutere fra noi e insieme a voi di quali sono stati negli anni recenti gli, eh, gli sviluppi attorno a questo tema. Eh, come eh, una nostra piccola tradizione eh, l'idea è quella di essere eh, orientati alla clinica eh, o quantomeno cercare di ragionare eh, all'interno delle cose che accadono come eh, dei clinici che si confrontano con, con la ricerca, con i sistemi diagnostici, eh, interrogando e eh, facendosi interrogare. E la, le persone che eh, animeranno la mattinata sono persone che eh, condividono eh, interessi eh, per la ricerca e eh, un'anima clinica. Eh, e questa eh, è la caratterizzazione con la quale abbiamo eh, cercato di presentarvi delle persone che nei loro campi eh, sono eh, di indubbio rilievo. Eh, adesso brevemente vado alla presentazione. Eh, il primo ospite eh, è, è John Clark, che è una figura storica della ricerca clinica nell'area eh, dei borderline. È una delle persone che ha scritto il destino, l'approfondimento, soprattutto con una chiave, come dicevo prima, in maniera particolare dell'intreccio fra clinica e e ricerca, che non è una cosa semplice, non è una cosa diffusa perché eh, per molto tempo, forse troppo tempo, i clinici hanno fatto i clinici eh, per i fatti loro, i ricercatori hanno continuato a ricercare per i fatti loro e quindi la capacità, la possibilità che ci siano dei campi che si interrogano è estremamente rara. Eh, sarebbe molto lungo fare un, un riassunto delle qualifiche di John Clarkin, brevemente vi ricordo che è co-direttore insieme a Kerberg del Personality Disorder Institute del New York uh, Presbyterian Hospital a New York, insegna clinica psichiatrica alla Wayne Medical College della Cornell University sempre a New York, è stato presidente della società internazionale di ricerca in psicoterapia e negli ultimi uh, 30 anni è stato un, un autore di decine di contributi sull'aspetto fenomenologico, cioè sulla presentazione di solo borderline, sui correlati neurobiologici e il trattamento. Insieme al gruppo coordinato da Kerberg, è uno delle, degli ideatori, delle persone che ha maggiormente contribuito all'elaborazione della terapia focalizzata sul transfer, eh, di cui abbiamo già avuto modo di parlare eh, gennaio scorso, insieme a Yeomans e a, a Kerberg stesso che come molti di voi sanno è una psicoterapia dinamica orientata sul transfer che si è aperta alla verifica, alla possibilità di verifica empirica sull'efficacia. Fa parte del comitato esecutivo della eh, società internazionale per l'appunto della TFP. Eh, sono molto contento che John Clarkin sia qui e gli altri relatori, così presento un po' tutti per la mattinata e poi diamo il via ai lavori. Eh, proseguirà eh, Andrea Fossati eh, che... Eh, è un vecchio amico che conosco da, ahimè, credo una trentina d'anni, eh, ahimè, eh, non perché lo conosco da trent'anni, ma perché vuol dire che il tempo è passato. Eh, abbiamo iniziato assieme eh, presso eh, il gruppo del San Raffaele, il piccolo gruppo del San Raffaele, eh, e mano a mano 
siamo, uh, siamo cresciuti. Eh, lui è rimasto a San Raffaele, è ordinario di psicologia clinica uh, ed è uh, una persona che ha sempre avuto un grande talento per, per la ricerca, per la metodologia, oltre che per gli aspetti clinici. Uh, è uno degli autori italiani nel campo della personalità sicuramente più citati, uh, soprattutto nell'area della, della ricerca sulle strutture latenti, eh, sia dell'area Bordenen che più recentemente, come avremo modo di vedere, del risultato narcisistico di personalità. Insieme a molti altri contributi sono le cose che lo qualificano maggiormente ed è una persona molto citata e molto ascoltata anche eh, all'interno del, del divenire del DSM V. Eh, Chiara De Panfilis è eh, ricercatore presso eh, il Dipartimento di Neuroscienze dell'Università di Parma e eh, è una, una ricercatrice molto attenta anch'essa agli studi eh, diciamo così, di lungo termine sui disturbi di personalità. È, è probabilmente una delle poche persone, se non l'unica, che eh, in Italia ha pubblicato eh, su questo tipo di approfondimento. Eh, ha lavorato un anno con, con John Clarkin eh, su questi temi, adesso è tornata a Parma e quando non le fanno fare le guardie eh, in pronto soccorso continua i suoi studi eh, come ricercatrice eh, infine eh, c'è il sottoscritto che eh, forse per le persone che erano qua è fin troppo noto per cui evito anche di autopresentarmi eh, mi darà una mano anzi adesso lascerò la parola eh, come coordinatore della mattinata a Sergio Dazzi che anche egli è, è conosciuto dalla, dalla Bicocca, è presidente del PD Lab ed è eh, un collega amico con cui lavoriamo da tempo, eh, che da sempre, e, e, quando lo conosco, ha sempre avuto una grande capacità di lavoro e di approfondimento nell'area della personalità. Eh, anche lui, 30 anni fa, era del piccolo gruppo del San Raffaele, eh, poi siamo tutti dispersi, eccetera. Per cui direi che possiamo dare il via alla, ai lavori e poi mano a mano chiederò a Sergio di coordinare un po' eh, sia le domande sia gli eventuali interventi. Uh, grazie, do la parola a John Clarkin che farà una presentazione dal titolo uh, Personality Disorders, what we know and when are we going? Buongiorno. <laughs> And now that I've given my talk in Italian, I'd like to switch to English. <laughs> okay. Uh, good morning. It's a real pleasure to be here. And I thank Emanuele Preti and his group for inviting me. I'm going to try to talk to you about 35 years of investigating borderline personality disorder in about 45 minutes. So my usual tendency would be to talk very fast. But I've been told I should talk slowly, and that way we can understand each other. Is that okay? So it's a rather grandiose title. What do we know, and where do we go from here? And I have a great gratitude to my colleagues. Um, the wonderful thing about our work is that these colleagues and myself are a team, and it's an interactive and uh, interdisciplinary team. So one theme is we're trying to put together uh, good psychiatry uh, with good psychodynamic thinking, with good psychological research, and with good uh, neurocognitive science. And that's a lot to accomplish, and so I have great gratitude to all these people. 
So first of all, I'm going to try to say a few words about uh, research under DSM-4. Basically, the thing is, it's unfortunate, but DSM-4 and 3 have fostered research on borderline personality disorder and not the other disorders. That's a serious limitation, so the rest of this will be talking about not all personality disorders, but borderline. So what do we know about borderline personality disorders? What serious questions remain, and where do we go from here? I'll try to touch on phenomenology, neurobehavioral functioning, development, and the fact that we have now multiple treatments that reduce symptoms. First of all, we've used a factor analysis to find borderline factors across people. We've used finite mixture modeling procedures to find groups of people, not factors. And then uh, we're beginning to use what's called event monitoring to get closer to the actual experience of the borderline patient. Of course, just to remind you, there are nine criteria for borderline personality disorder, and you should remember them because probably by 2013, they will disappear. Serious problem, which uh, Andrea Fassati is going to talk about later. Now the question is, how do these criteria hang together? That is, how do they relate to each other? Because without knowing how they relate to each other, it's like a Chinese menu where you pull out one of these and two of these and three of these, and you don't know how they're organized. And we have, and many other people now have used factor analysis to see how these nine individual phenomena hang together. And to overgeneralize quickly, there seem to be three different factors. A, a, an, what we call an identity factor with feelings of emptiness, boredom, fear of abandonment. There seems to be an anger, labile affect, an affective factor, and there seems to be an impulsivity factor. Now the problem is that um, factors don't describe people. So while you may have three different factors, how those are organized within individual people may be quite different. We've used a I'm sorry, a finite mixture modeling um, to figure out groups of people. I don't have time to go into it, but you have to tell the computer what variables to use that, that then identify these groups. And we have found that different combinations of aggression, paranoia, and antisocial behavior result in different groups of borderline patients. Group one is a relatively low severe borderline. That's another theme. A lot of the research does not capture the severity of the borderline patient. Group one is low severe. They are not so aggressive, they're not so paranoid, and they are not antisocial. Group two is an isolated group. They're low on aggression, that is, aggressive behavior outside themselves. They're very high on paranoia, suspiciousness, and they're moderate and antisocial. And group three tend to be high in aggression, high in antisocial, and moderate in paranoia. They're the highly symptomatic patients. Do you see where I'm going? If, for example, I had an outcome, a treatment study comparing Kernberg's treatment to Linehan's treatment, and Kernberg got all the group one patients, and Linehan got all the group three patients, I bet you could predict which treatment would look better. And what I'm saying is, in practically all the psychotherapy studies to date, these variables have not been taken into account. When you look at other features associated with group one, two, and three, you can find out certain variables that are related. A, a mini theme in my talk is how emotions are regulated. 
So a key variable, we think, and uh, Chiara will talk later more about this, but we think that key variables are emotion arousal and the ability to moderate that emotional arousal. So you see, group one has high constraint. That is, they have a high, relatively speaking to the other borderlines, they have a high ability to moderate their affect. Whereas group two are very distant from people and they have a history, they're more likely to have a history of sexual abuse. And group three has high negative affect and low constraint, that is low modulation of affect. They're the more seriously disturbed borderline patients. And this is just a slide to show you we're not the only ones that have found these groups. Paul Pilconis and his group at the University of Pittsburgh have also found, using these methods, very comparable subgroups of borderline patients. So one take-home message is everybody talks as if borderlines are all alike. They are not. There are distinct subgroups of these patients. Now I want to go to what's called event monitoring. It's known, it has various names, intensive repeated measurements in naturalistic settings, ecological momentary assessment or experience sampling. Just very basically, first of all, am I clear? Am I talking slowly enough? Is it okay? It's okay. Okay. So basically, in this world of, uh, of Palm Pilots, which are now out of date, and, uh, and smartphones, you can use smartphones to, to call borderline patients hmm, during the day and evening, and you can ask them to report on their experience. You can ask them to report on their experience in the last hour, or you can ask them to report on the interpersonal relations that they have experienced that day. Now this is a wonderful study that was done in Montreal uh, with uh, colleagues of Joel Paris. So they compared borderline subjects who were applying for treatment to, border, to community people who are not borderline. And they asked them to report for 20 days straight on every interaction with other people they had that day for five minutes or longer. And they asked them to report very specifically on the role between themselves and the other person. They asked them to report on the affect they felt in that situation. And they asked them to report on the perception of the other person in the interaction. And you can see why I, who work with Otto Kernberg, would be very interested in this, no? Because really what they're doing is they're trying to get a immediate, in the environment, perception of the object relationship, what Kernberg calls the object relationship between self and other. So it's based on a theory, actually not Kernberg's theory. All of this rejection sensitivity material, another term you will learn this morning, is based on a personality theory of functioning by Michelle and Shoda. Quite frankly, I believe that part of the problem with DSM-3, 4, and now DSM-5 which Dr. Fossati is going to tell you about, the, the committees don't seem to have a model, a guiding model, of either personality or personality disorder. If you don't have a model, then you get a group of people in a single room, and they start fighting with each other around who's right and who's wrong. That's precisely what happens every time the Personality Disorder Committee meets. So, I, I, not that I could solve the problem, but I'm just simply saying to you, 
human beings without models gather data that sometimes is meaningless. <laughs> and of course, people who dabble in models without gathering data could be way up in the sky and unrelated to reality. So we tend to think that the combination is better than either alone. So enough of that. What did they find? You won't be surprised that in this event monitoring across all subjects for 20 days, that the borderlines perceived and experienced more negative affect than the, than the normals. So borderlines tend to have their, if you will, information processing system infused with negative affect. Secondly, they perceived more negative affect when they perceived the other person as less agreeable than usual. And they also uh, had more negative affect when they perceived the other person as being agentic. That means when they perceive the other person as being active and assertive, and we think, contrary-wise, they probably perceive themselves as weak and ineffective. And it's in those kinds of object relationships, if you will, that these borderlines experienced negative affect, and we know from other studies that they sometimes then go into rage and it's in those situations that they often go into suicidal attempts. So you see what this research is doing. It's bringing us closer, closer to the process, to the natural process of what happens in the real world with borderline patients. The last point I want to make is at the bottom of this slide. It makes sense to all of us that if you have an interaction that you perceive as negative, then your next task, first of all, your first task is how do you behave in that situation? Do you curse the other person out? Do you hit the other person? Do you have an affect storm and walk away? Or do you relate in a somewhat neutral way? The second task is what do you do about that relationship that just occurred in your head? Do you dismiss it? Do you learn from it? Or do you just go away thinking the other person is a terrible person and you'll never relate to them again? Hmm? So there's two tasks, how you handle it in the situation and then of course how you think about it. Unfortunately, as you would expect, Borderline patients go away from a negative interaction and they brood about it. They obsess about it. What we call in English, they ruminate about it. And then that begins to interfere with their next interaction with somebody else. So you see the pattern. And if you're a therapist, in one way or another, whether I think whether you're DBT, MBT, or TFP, you're going to try to capture that sequence of events as it disturbs the borderline patient's relationships at work and their relationships in love relationships and friendships. I think uh, Kiara is going to talk about rejection sensitivity, and I feel the moments flighting away. I just want to say that if you want a, a glance, if you want an interesting comparison, you should read Otto Kernberg's recent writings on object relations theory. And then you should go to Michelle and Shoda, who are not psychodynamic. They, they, are, they are theorists of personality, normal personality functioning. And this is a schema of their sense of the process of human interaction, going from uh, situations, is that me? <laughs> oh, thank you, oh, thank you. Going from situations, like this room you're, we're in, this is a situation, and what kind of cognitive affective units 
this situation stimulates in your brain. And then how you act upon that, and then the, the outcome of that, which then feeds back then into how you see yourself. So in some ways, these cognitive affective units are somewhat similar to the object relations that Kernberg has talked about. Now, rejection sensitivity is a theory based on Michelle and Shoda's personality theory about a dominant cognitive affective unit in some people's minds. Uh, Kiara is going to talk about that in more detail, so I'm just going to simply say that all of us are sensitive to rejection. We have our antenna out all the time to figure out if other people are accepting us or rejecting us. Right now, I'm a little anxious because I'm trying to look at your eyes and see if my English is getting into your Italian way of thinking and whether you accept me or reject me. Right? OK. So I may have an affect storm, or I may try to answer your questions <laughs> in a rational way. So the basic notion is that borderline patients are seriously, seriously inflicted with a sense of rejection sensitivity. So they go around all the time with a profound sense of being rejected. And I think any therapy is going to have to deal with the rejection-sensitive nature of the way they think about themselves as weak, defective, shameful, and the other as judging and negative. And if you're a therapist, of course, you have to keep in mind that any little thing you do may be perceived by the borderline patient as you're rejecting that patient. That's OK, by the way. We tend to think uh, that it's good if ruptures in the relationship with the patient and therapist arise. Because we think they always arise. It's just that sometimes therapists are not aware of it. We think it's best to be aware of it and try to use it therapeutically. Now, I just want to go um, to neurobiological underpinnings for a minute. This is a beautiful slide uh, done by Chiara. And if you recall the three factors in the factor analysis of borderline personality disorder derived right from the criteria. So you have affective instability, you have impulsivity, and you have identity interpersonal disturbances. Now, if you think in red about the underpinning neurobiological systems, what you're going to see, I think, in the next 15 years, whatever happens to DSM-5, what you're going to see, I think, are attempts by various laboratories to relate the uh, behavior of borderline patients, such as affective instability, into underlying neurobiological systems. So relating affective instability to negative affect systems, impulsivity to approach reward, positive affect systems. You hear a lot these days about oxytocin. And relating identity interpersonal disturbances to underlying systems in the brain around attachment, rejection sensitivity, mentalization, and so forth. Now, we've dabbled in this a little bit. Um, and the reason we've dabbled in the fMRI uh, environment is because we at Cornell are looking for uh, fMRI tasks and related biological systems that we could use in therapy outcome. So I think the era has come 
You know, Freud, in 1895, gave up on trying to put together a scientific theory of personality because, as a neurologist, he didn't have the tools to complete the task. And I think he made, who am I to say, but probably a wise choice because the tools were not there. Today, we have a lot of the tools, I think, that are beginning to inform us. So, for example, this is just a small example, and this is not a task we're going to use. You have to try these things out and see how they work. But just to give you a feel, we worked with David Silberswag at Cornell. We got borderlines and normals, and we put them in the scanner, their head in the scanner, and we gave them a key that they could push. And we presented them with words. We presented them with positive words, sunshine, happiness, good friends, those kinds of words, neutral words, and negative words. Negative words like suicide, blood, cutting, etc. And their task was to look at the words and either push the key, which is go, or not push the key, which is no go. I don't have time to go into it, but we primed them to push the key as fast as possible. And then we presented the words in go and no go conditions. So that means there are six different boxes or conditions, and there are six different ways that the borderlines and normals could be different. Can you make a hypothesis in which box they would be different? And I gave you a small clue. <laughs> we don't have time to discuss it, but clearly the red box, hmm? the no-go condition. So when you see negative stimuli and you're, 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 you're uh, indicated that you not push the button, even though you have a tendency, you've been primed to push the button. What I think, what we think that means is that borderline patients, their information, sense, their information system is primed to see negativity. In fact, some borderlines interpreted the neutral cues as negative. And it's especially when they need to control the affect in the impulse condition, this is the impulse condition, the no-go. It's especially in a no-go condition that they have trouble in inhibiting their response. So what does that mean? Uh, who knows, uh, but, but we think that it may mean that the, oh, I'm sorry, then at the brain level, to, to, to oversimplify it, because um, I'm not a neurobiologist, the, in the borderlines, while they were functioning in these conditions, their amygdala, their emotional response, was quite high, quite dramatic, and their control mechanisms in the prefrontal areas were under-functioning. You can see where we're going, can't you? We're trying to see if psychotherapy, whatever kind, whatever mixture, can change this system. So can you help borderline patients who have intense emotional reactions, especially to social cues like rejection sensitivity? Can you help them learn, uh, if you will, ego skills, skills, learn ways to modulate that affect so they can fit into relationships with other people in a much more fruitful way. And that's just the same thing um, in different ways. I, I want to spend one minute just on development. There's a lot of studies on development. Uh, we know that borderline personality disorder runs in families. Uh, twin samples would suggest that uh, it is hereditable. There are hereditary factors in borderline personality disorder. And clearly, there are psychosocial developmental factors. A retrospective studies link harsh treatment with later borderline personality disorder, and that's been confirmed by longitudinal prospective studies. 
So for example, there are correlation between borderline personality symptoms at age 28 and measures of early attachment experience. So you can see the variables, maternal history of medical problems, infant emotionality, maltreatment, attachment disorganization, maternal hostility, and maternal life stress. It's also interesting to me as a person who likes Michelle and Shoda's cognitive affective units and Kernberg's dominant object relationships, it's interesting to me that if you look at a score of the composite self, uh, self-index in developing people, that, that, that attachment organization relates to borderline symptoms, but so does attachment uh, disorganization by itself. So clearly, the internal conception of self and others does have an impact on the development of these borderline symptoms. This is from Fonagy. Peter Fonagy, whose work I like a great deal, and he suggests that what this means is, what this means, who knows, but affect regulation, or it's the lack thereof, attention control, what we're going to call effortful control, the ability to control your attention, what what stimuli you look at, and mentalization, all contribute to a disorganization, disorganization of self and to borderline symptoms. Now let me talk for a minute. I can go till about 10, 15, is that right? Okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the psychotherapy. What's going on in the current scene? And what are the implications of that, of where we go next? Now obviously we're in an era of empirical based, evidence-based medicine. Uh, You need empirical evidence for your treatment, but also uh, if you read the guidelines carefully, you have to uh, put together the evidence with your clinical judgment. So for example, what that means to me is uh, there may be a lot of patients that respond to DBT, but given the fact that we know there's at least three different kinds of borderlines, it may be quite possible that certain kinds of borderlines don't respond to DBT and you as a clinician have to use your judgment. So a number of treatments, TFP, MBT, DBT, are supported by two or more randomized trials showing symptom change. However, I will show you in a minute a recent meta-analysis by my colleague Ken Levy. There's no evidence that any treatment, any one treatment, is better than the other. We know, therefore, that these complex packages, like DBT, if you've read the DBT manual, it's got everything in it except the kitchen sink. Marcia does everything she can to change these patients, and it makes sense. But then when you come to the end and DBT works, you don't know what part of it is working. As Alan Kasdan has so beautifully said, Uh, You know, people who write manuals uh, think that they know exactly why the manual works. And, of course, Marsha does. Uh, And so does Otto Kernberg, to be fair. Um, But he says, if you really are careful about it, there may be things in the treatment package that work, that help the patient. There may be things in the treatment package that don't make any difference at all, and they're just superstitious uh, behavior of the therapist. And there actually may be uh, procedures in there that make the patient worse. So we don't know how these uh, work. And, of course, finally, we don't know how these treatments work for the different subtypes of borderline patients. As I said, my colleague has recently put together, reviewed 73 studies, and he finds no difference in effect sizes between cognitive behavioral and dynamic treatments. And basically, all the moderators of of change, all the moderators of the results, were actually not patient characteristics, but characteristics of how the studies were designed. So it's clear the studies have an impact on the results in terms of how they're designed, but it's not clear at the moment what patient variables relate 
to differences in outcome. I think I will not go over that just to show you these are all the randomized trials, these are all the controlled trials included in that meta-analysis, and these are all the uncontrolled trials included in that meta-analysis. So, what questions remain, and where do we go from here? I think my colleague Mark Lenzenweger has put his finger on what's missing. Our models of personality disorder are deficient, are lacking. I think Kernberg's is one of the most developed, but clearly all of them need amplification and evidence. So, I mean, uh, Lenzenweger is saying that what personality disorder is, is a complex emergent end product of interacting processes. So you have interacting neurobiological, psychological factors which then result in the personality in front of you. And he says we need a much clearer delineation of the personality systems that are underpinning, that, that have underpinned uh, personality disorder at the neural behavioral level. And then beyond that, we need genetic and epigenetic studies. So now, Dr. Fasanti is going to talk to you about DSM-4 to DSM-5. Uh, I think we have to be somewhat objective and ask ourselves, is it going to be an improvement or not? I guess time will tell. I think one danger that I perceive is that all the data, all the empirical research we've done on borderline personality disorder could actually get lost uh, in people's minds or in their their functioning if the criteria are so different uh, that we can't relate the new research to the old and vice versa. But the conception behind it, I just want to say one thing about the conception behind DSM-5. The leaders of the whole thing say that we need a shift because they think that we all, clinicians, researchers, have made a, um, a reification out of the categories. They say that, guess what? In 1993, we had the fantasy that you could relate one disorder, let's say schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, personality disorder, to one or a set of genes, and that we could then isolate the pathogenesis, including the genes, to that category. And those those leaders today in American psychiatry are saying, that was so oversimplistic. That was such an, you know, simplistic notion. And so therefore, DSM-5 should emphasize not categories, but dimensions. Various dimensions of pathology that hopefully could be measured in terms of uh, various levels of severity. That's the overall intent. Of course, often uh, uh, there's a lot that gets lost between the coffee cup and the lip, and uh, how it gets executed uh, may, may create problems. I think another question is, will DSM-5 stimulate research across the spectrum of personality disorders? For reasons I don't totally understand, DSM-4 fostered research in borderline but not the other disorders. Now, what's going to happen in the United States is, is, I don't know whether it's going to be good or bad, but you have the DSM-5 people over here, and they're talking about the phenomenological behavioral level of all disorders, including personality disorders. You have the people over here at the National Institute of Mental Health And at the moment, they're saying they are not interested in DSM-5 categories. They're not interested at all. What they're interested in are what they call uh, research 
domain criteria. So they are not interested, for, let me give you an example. They are not interested in research on borderline patients. They would be interested in research on emotion dysregulation. And they assume that emotion dysregulation is not limited to borderlines, that a lot of patients, a lot of our patients have emotion dysregulation. So they want, and they assume, and these, they state their assumptions very clearly, and you can ask yourself, do you agree with these assumptions? First of all, they assume that mental, mental disorders are disorders of brain circuits, and that these brain circuits can be identified with the tools of neuroscience, and data will yield biosignatures, in other words, brain circuit information that can inform treatment. How you focus treatment, what patients are more likely to respond to your treatment, etc. Now remember I told you the assumption in 1993 that there was one gene and categories are right. This assumption may be, turn out to be totally, as totally naive, but I do, think, I do think it makes sense to look at the psychological organization of borderline patients, such as how sensitive they are to rejection, and to look at the underlying neurobiological systems that relate to that. So how, do, in, that, in that regard, how does psychotherapy work? As I said, the empirically supported treatments are large packages, uh, they're complex. Which elements in those packages work? And since all these treatments work, maybe they have common factors across these treatments. So I think there's a growing number of us, myself, included, who are talking about treatment integration. So would it be possible to evaluate the individual patient, even if that person meets criteria for borderline, that person, as we know now, has individual characteristics that makes that person different from other borderlines? And then would it be possible to think of the domains of dysfunction in that patient and then to use the best strategies and techniques from the empirically validated treatments to approach that particular patient? That makes sense to me. I'd be curious in a discussion if that makes sense to you. And of course, the next issue would be how would you construct that in a rational way. There are dangers in that. Uh, one danger is, uh, you, you know the joke? It's always difficult to tell jokes in a different culture. Uh, but there's a New Yorker cartoon where you can see B.F. Skinner and you see two mice in a maze. Get the idea? And, and you can tell in the, in the cartoon that one mouse is saying to the other mouse, you know, we've really got this guy trained because every time we go down this alley, he feeds us. <laughs> now, why am I telling that joke? Because I think sometimes the therapist is not teaching the patient, but the patient is reinforcing the therapist. So the person in charge of the interaction, if you watch closely, is the patient. So borderline patients, for example, can threaten suicide and make certain therapists jump through hoops and respond in ways that the patient wants. So what I'm saying is that the danger of an integrated treatment is that the integrated therapist is little unsure of which way to go, and the patient takes over. So 
Theoretically, though, integration would involve the matching of the specific problem areas of the patient, in this case borderlines, with a range of techniques selected from the empirically supported treatments. And of course, the level of severity would relate to that. So the very severe patients, have, you, you have to have primary emphasis on safety. Those are the patients that are trying to kill themselves all the time. And you'd use modules there for uh, reduction of suicidal behavior. But of course, a lot of borderline patients are not suicidal, do not cut themselves, and they present different problem areas at different levels of severity. Let me give you a concrete example, and then I think I will quit so that my colleagues have their allotted time. I'm just saying here that, again, across treatments for borderline patients, I do think that if the treatment works, the therapist becomes a very important person in that patient's life. The therapist becomes an anchor for that patient. That doesn't mean that the, the patient loves the therapist. I think typically the patient loves and hates the therapist. But, but the therapy and the therapist becomes a center of their lives around which they organize many of their thoughts and feelings and actions. And that's probably a common element that cuts across these various treatments. So let's consider how each of these treatments that have been empirically validated manages the therapeutic relationship. First of all, thinking about how the therapist reacts to the borderline patient is universal and cross-theoretical. It is true that uh, psychodynamic people have used words for this like transference and countertransference, words that cognitive behavior people don't use. And I think it's fair to say if you look carefully at the manuals of these treatments, they give different emphases to the patient-therapist relationship. They all say you should have a good alliance. They, they all say you should have support, uh, respect for the patient. They all say you should handle your negative feelings toward the patient. And I think those are obvious. Those are obvious. But if you read the manuals carefully, I think you see different emphases in the, in the focus of the treatment itself around the relationship with, between the patient and the therapist. Uh, Marsha Linehan and uh, some of her colleagues, uh, like the woman, uh, Shelley McMain, who just completed the wonderful study in Montreal comparing uh, DBT to a, uh, a general uh, clinical management treatment, uh, suggests that DBT only attends to the relationship between the patient and the therapist when you have to. When the relationship becomes what Marshall calls a therapy interfering behavior, then you have to address it. And I can understand that. That's, that's one orientation. It seems to me it doesn't put very much emphasis on the relationship between the two. It's, it's like the relationship doesn't matter as much as long as the patient comes, it doesn't interfere, and let's think about how they're using their skills outside of this room. MBT, mentalization-based therapy, puts more emphasis on the relationship between the patient and the therapist because it's interested in mentalizing. That is, how does the patient understand the feelings and attitudes of the therapist, and how does the therapist try to understand and struggles to understand the internal experiences of the patient in the relationship with the therapist. So they will spend a lot of time saying, well, the patient says, you know, you rejected me. I'm oversimplifying. And the MBT therapist says, wait a minute, I, I, don't, I didn't know I reject. How did I reject you? And tell me how I did that, because I, I need to learn something. And then, then they, they try to explore that. 
And then, of course, the treatment that puts the most focus on it uh, is TFP. So TFP uh, really tries, in somewhat of a unique way, I'm suggesting a dimension here. Notice, from an integrative point of view, I'm suggesting that in some ways the, the, the similarities between these tr treatments may, may override the differences. Who knows? Um, but TFP certainly would put a major focus on how this sense of rejection, how this sense, internal sense of perception of self and other, how these cognitive affective units are activated in the relationship, in the here and now, with the therapist. Notice, notice another common element across this dimension is that all three of these treatments focus almost entirely on the here and now. There's, of course, a myth that psychodynamic people have to talk about when you were one or two years old and you're toilet training and so forth. Uh, th that just isn't true about, when, certainly when you're looking at, at dynamic treatments for borderline patients. So, in summary, what do we know? Well, I think we know a lot about borderline phenomenology, including subgroups. We know that they have certain neurobehavioral, uh, neurocognitive deficits, especially in the system that, that has to do with emotion and motion regulation. And we also know that multiple treatments work. That is, they work for symptom change. They're not very good at helping people get into work and love. What are the remaining key questions? How do treatments have their effect? And will psychotherapy change the underlying neurobiological systems? And if they do, will that indicate a maintenance of the change? And where do we go from here? I look to my colleagues to tell you about that, uh, DSM-5, neurobiology, and I thank you very much for your attention.